It's the biggest stumbling block from understanding Buddhist psychology, period. The word attachment. So what Buddha means by this is this. First of all, he says we have negative, neurotic, delusional, disturbing, miserable, self-centered, fear-based states of mind, along with compassion and kindness and intelligence and love and empathy and all the others. So we have a bunch of good stuff and we have a bunch of bad stuff. He makes this utter distinction because he has found from his experience, as I mentioned before, that we can rid the mind of all the rubbish and grow all the goodness. So if this is what you're aiming for in Buddhism, this is where you're heading on the map, then you've got to start first distinguishing between the negative and the positive. We absolutely do not think this way in our culture. But your question is, is, is inferring this one. So if it's true that we have a, a bunch of neurotic states of mind and Buddha says they're the source of my pain and I have a bunch of good qualities and they're the source of my happiness and I want to be happy and don't want suffering, well, it's a no-brainer. I better learn what he means by these words. So there's a hierarchy of the neurotic ones. I like to call them the voices of ego. And what Buddha means by ego is if we understood it, we'd be breaking our hearts with compassion for ourselves, not beating ourselves up, you know, because they're the source of our pain. So the fundamental one in day-to-day -day life that is the source of our pain is what Buddha calls attachment. And this is too shocking for us. So try and hear it freshly, okay? Basically, it's multifaceted. We get born with it. It's the most primordial level of it the deepest energetic level of it is a feeling of never being enough, never having enough. No matter what I get, not enough. No matter how much praise, never enough. No matter how much food, never enough. No matter how many things, never enough. That's just an energy of dissatisfaction. It's just the default mode in all of us. And that can be very strong for some of us. On the basis of this, this is the deepest level of attachment, the next level, because it's multifaceted, is naturally, because you feel you've never got enough, you're hankering after something, and guess where? Out there. Objects of the senses. Hardly rocket science. So that's going to be food, bodies, handbags, things, objects of sound, objects of, objects of the ear, objects of taste, objects of touch, objects of eyes. It's called the, human, it's called the planet. It's basically a bunch of sense objects, isn't it? So attachment then goes to one of those because the second we open our eyes in the day, that's what we see. That's what we, that's what we experience through our senses. So those objects are massive and attachment just gloms onto any one of them depending on your personality. Some people can be alcohol. Some people can be sex. Some is food. Some is, you know, some could be handbags. Some could be the shape of your body. I mean, attachment is is brilliant in finding something to glom onto that then the next level of which then exa attachment exaggerates the deliciousness and the importance in your life of that person, handbag, sound, whatever, and then completely believes when I get it, then I'll get satisfied. So that's we spend most of our lives. So what we mean by happiness in our world Buddha calls it samsara. What we mean by happiness is when attachment gets what it wants. How'd you go today, Rabina? Oh, I had a lovely day. What happened? Well, hubby was kind. He put the toilet seat down. He helped with the dishes. The breakfast was delicious. The lights were green. The weather's lovely. The lunch is lovely. The boss thanked me. And the kids are kind. You kind of get my mind. No one's going to question this. And it sounds rather cruel to say that Buddha says that's what's actually happening is your attachment got what it wanted. So attachment essentially is a junkie in us. The universe has it. Buddha's just way more radical in his view of us all being mentally ill. And I'm not joking here. I sound so dramatic how I say it. So, you know, Amy mentioned being, you know, substance abuse, didn't you? Well, Buddha says we're all addicts. We're all junkies. That's because we've all got attachment. But it's a question of degree and it's a question of the object. So we can see in our world some objects are more powerful, like substances, as she indicated, heroin or cocaine or alcohol or cigarettes. They're very powerful objects. Maybe attachment to eating chocolate cake is also kind of powerful when you get enough of it that makes you 20, you know, 50 kilos overweight. Then it can be a problem. Or the sugar for your diabetes. We can see that. But al you know, alcohol and other things are more dramatic and more easy to get problems, isn't it? But the, the Buddha says attachment is normal for all beings. And this is where it's kind of shocking because we have a view that those people at that end have a problem and I'm normal. Well, Buddha says we're all mentally ill. And I really say I think that phrase, mental illness, he would have liked. Because he says attachment 
And then when attachment doesn't get what it wants, that's when the problems start and that's anger, that's aversion, that's fear, that's despair, that's annoyance, irritation, upset or depression or anxiety. They're all the variations of thwarted attachment. And this is so normal in us, it seems kind of shocking to hear that it's a problem. So the point is this, the stronger we have the craving and the neediness to get this, it's really like an emotional hunger to get this and to get that, and then certainly the deeper one of getting human beings to love us and to approve of us and think we're gorgeous, whatever, all these levels of attachment, it's a bottomless pit. The, when we get what attachment wants, that's what we mean by happiness. Now, the point is, when it doesn't, that's the arising of aversion, as I said, irritation, annoyed, upset, anger, or despair. And this is normal human behavior. But it's only for us when it builds up to the point where it's about, you're about to murder your husband or yourself that we then notice we're having a problem. So this is what Buddha means by being in samsara. We're driven by this craving to get what we want. And then we get upset and distressed when we don't. And that could be either being abused, having the hubby leave you, getting the cancer, getting the red light. It can be small, it can be big. But this is the kind of the, the analysis that Buddhism gives. So this is a bit shocking because we're all like this to one degree or another, you know. This is why he says we need to pay attention to our mind because we can lessen the attachment. So what does that look like? Then, then, so then the difference between, okay, the difference between happiness that is natural when we get what attachment wants, especially when it's really blissful, like the gorgeous new boyfriend who utterly adores me and I can't believe the joy. It's like I finally found heaven. We all know that experience. So there's nothing, you see, Buddhism analyzes all this very clearly. Happiness or joy or pleasure or bliss, more of that, the better, darling. He's not complaining about that. But basically what he says is the joy and bliss we experience now is the bliss of a junkie. Because it comes only when attachment gets what it wants. So then, in other words, think about it. What other method do we have in our world to trigger pleasant feelings? We've got to get a sense object. We've got to get praise or a lovely person or good things happen or money in the bank or good health. We depend upon getting what attachment wants to get any pleasure at all. And because it's so fragile and you can't guarantee the hubby will continue to love you and you can't guarantee that chocolate cake will keep making you happy and you know that because you eat, keep eating it, you'll vomit eventually. Do you understand? So we, so we don't analyse it. We just just think, oh, there's cake, it'll make me happy. Before you know it, you're vomiting. But you, you, you adore Fred before you know it, he's giving you up for a younger version and we crash to despair. We know this and it's not being cynical, but we just take it for granted. So then, of course, for us, we are desperate for good feelings, which is called happiness or bliss. Now, this is Buddha's point and it sounds kind of weird, but try and hear me in practical, ordinary language. Don't hear it as holy. What Buddha says is this. Hey guys, I've got some methods to get such joy and bliss, you won't believe it. Okay? Because he had, and they wax lyrical in all the literature about how our mind, our consciousness, when he's not talking about our brain, our consciousness is naturally pure in its nature when it's unencumbered by the junk, it is only blissful. So when you've lessened attachment and lessened anger and lessened despair and lessened fears, you will only experience more joy and more bliss naturally. It's for Buddha a completely natural characteristic of our own consciousness, our cognitive process, that the, the result of lessening delusions is the growth in joy, compassion, love, and all the other positive qualities. They, for the Buddha, are at the core of our being. So basically, it's like this. We think happiness is what we get when we get what attachment wants. Buddha says, yeah, it's okay, but it doesn't last and it's polluted anyway. He says, genuine happiness, and don't hear it as holy, happiness, joy, bliss, whatever word you like, is what you get as and when you lessen the neuroses. Can you hear that? So if you have a lovely friend and you've got delight in their happiness and you're laughing about their latest wonderful pursuits and you're delighted for them, that's kind of pure love because it's not based on attachment. When you have love and affection and compassion, they are not eye-based. They're not neurotic. They are empathetic and we can have examples of those. We do have examples of those when we can have those, but we can't sustain them. 
because we're always dependent on getting the right object. Or the second we have a pain in our knee, it's hard to have a pleasant feeling, isn't it? Because we're so obsessed with the body and getting nice feelings. So we're basically junkies, Buddha says. For cake, for this, for food, for pleasant, feel for pleasant feelings. But the pleasant feelings are fine. But our trouble is we sort of then think it's, oh, you feel guilty. Oh, pleasure sounds a bit sort of like a sin, you know. Do you understand? So Buddha's not saying give up pleasure. He says give up attachment. Give up being a junkie. Give up being a junkie. Give up attachment and fears and anger. And of course it's hard. Then what will arise naturally is a more stable, joyful, fulfilled, content, happy, joyful, compassionate person. You. This is Buddha's deal. Can we hear the words? I mean, simple words, not complicated. It's not going to heaven or anything. Do you understand? It's just hard. It's the hardest damn job we'll ever do. But can you hear the logic of it? This is Buddhist psychology. I think he's great. I think he's very intelligent, quite frankly. I mean, I'm so intelligent that I know he's intelligent, right? I think Buddha's great. I love him. But it's a hard job. Are you understanding? It can be a good carrot. Don't be afraid of a carrot. It's a good one to know. No, that's really important. Don't get all holy about it. The only damn reason to want to give up attachment and jealousy and anger is because I'll get more happy. Do not put that down. That is damn fantastic. Then you can do the compassion wing and help others. So we've got to first know that we are up to here with suffering. That's the only reason to give up your rubbish, not out of some holy reason. We've got to know we're suffering and know why we're suffering. It's not the thing that happened. It's not the husband. It's, that's why it's so shocking to hear this. That was a catalyst for it. But it's my pain, my grief, my despair, my anger, my stuff. And then we can own that. It kind of, we can have, and then we can also own our good stuff. Then we feel more grown up and more courageous and more fearless, not guilty. Do you understand, darling? So we've got to first know that we've got this marvelous potential to be joyfully happy. And I mean it sincerely, not like Pollyanna. That's Buddha's first stages of practice. When you've got that together, then you can really want to have compassion for others because we're all in the same boat. And then you do it eventually out of compassionate reasons, one step at a time though. But you've got to be motivated by your own happiness. Don't ever think you shouldn't be. Really and truly. So the reason to, you want to be happy, Buddha says it's our natural potential to be happy, to be joyful. But it's the mind that's unencumbered by the ridiculous rubbish. But don't also hold your breath. It's way to go. So even though you're still living in all the rubbish with all the rubbish there, you're confident that, like I'm saying to Amy, you can be confident that you're moving towards something and then you get joy on the way. You can enjoy the, you can enjoy the process. It's really, it's a bit like, you know, let's say you think you're 50 kilos overweight and you think it's permanent. You can never be less than 50 kilos overweight and you have a, revolu a revelation and someone tells you, you know, you can lose weight. Oh, Really? So you get all excited. So you go to the gym and you start on a diet. So then you, you know, now you come home, you're actually feeling worse after the first day at the gym, aren't you? So because you know you've got a method, you still look in the mirror, you're still 50 k's overweight, but suddenly you appear very different to yourself now because you're now confident that you have a method and you just, this is my point to Amy, you just keep moving, Amy. There's absolute certainty that we can become happy, but, and, and, but don't, Hold it like a, don't be frantic about it. We can be prepared for the struggle and the suffering knowing what we're heading towards that. That's good. Own your rubbish, but own your good stuff too. You let it sit there and quietly not, this is a very good point, honey. I like to call them all my, all my crazy roommates. We've all got thousands of thoughts in our head. Have you noticed? Uncontrolled, berserk, never ending, isn't it? So then they you see, because the unhappy ones, we wish they'd go away. When they're really distressing, we wish they'd go away. We will do anything on the planet to make them go away. That is even why we try to kill ourselves, because we can't stand the pain. And that's because, ironically, that's because attachment is a junkie that only wants the nice things. So it's because of our frantic attachment to feel good. It's a very strange way to say it. So the courage of practice is that you know your old rubbish is there, the ancient habits. But you, when the more you buy into and listen to and identify yourself with your kindness, your intelligence, your compassion, your empathy, with your goodness, we never pay attention to that stuff. We only pay attention to the anger and the fears and, we do, and they loom large in our mind. Do you understand? So if we learn to realise we've got all these crazy roommates and we are living in a house full of crazies and they're all shouting and yelling, and they do run the show pretty much sometimes. But when you've got courage, you, f you listen to them. You don't wish they'd go away. 
You accept that they're there and the less you give power to them and the more power you give to the other good roommates who will then come out of the cupboard and under the bed because they've been scared to come out, then you start to identify more with your good qualities and you get more courageous in accepting the rubbish and they start to become quieter because you're not giving power to them. But you're not freaked out about those crazy parts of yourself. You're learning to make friends with them. And I can't stress this enough. Yes. Not to let them off the hook. Anger is a maniac. Jealousy is a maniac. Depression is a destroyer. But they're there. They're all bloody habits. But you can't just want, wanting to go away won't help. Just resisting them is another problem. Guilt about them is another problem. Accept that they're there, but when you're giving less power to those crazies, you're being more benign towards this part of yourself. But you're reinforcing your good qualities and your current confidence and your compassion and your intelligence and you're talking yourself through it. It's okay, Rabina. It's just your crazy anger. Shut up, you know. It's all right. So you give you, – you, it's, it's, this is a massive shifting point. We have to, a, a shift – a point we have to – a paradigm shift we have to make because they won't go away quickly. So we have to, Amy, we have to rejoice. You, where's Amy? You have to every day rejoice. Rejoice in your progress. Rejoice in your beauty. Rejoice in your intelligence. Rejoice in your compassion. But we do not. Are you hearing me, Amy? That will lift you up. But we remember the rubbish and then we hear it then we feel guilty about the guilt. Then we get angry with the anger. We keep adding new roommates all the time. The more, the less power we give them, the less fear we have in hearing them, the more, they, it's like almost they begin to diminish. The more power we give them, the more we freak out about them, and the more we wish they'd go away, the bigger they loom large. I really mean it. They're only thoughts. Thoughts are like ephemeral. Really. Do you hear me, people? But we never remember our good qualities. Amy, just by listening to you, I can see that you're intelligent and compassionate and wise and kind and loving and forgiving. How about remembering those parts of yourself, honey? But we don't, we don't, we don't. It's so astonishing that we don't. This is the irony of ego. We are junkies for our misery. We are junkies for our negative. Almost thinking it's virtuous. Are we communicating, people? <laughs> Whew. Yes, joke. Microphone here, please. Oh, you go, go, go darling, go. Talk, talk. I'll go to the microphone. Go, go, go. <laughs> I've just got a very little, sure, very darling. little clarification, Chris, about yeah. the mind. Yeah. Um, as I see it as a continuum, and, and and that's how I think Buddhists think of it as certainly a, and, every millisecond. And, it's like a river of mental moments. Yes. Yeah. And, and is it our link between our previous oh, lives? Is it a link? Our link, oh, okay. Is that where the imprint of our previous I understand, lives darling. I didn't want to go into that one, but maybe yeah. now you've asked it, maybe okay. I can. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, no, no yeah. problem. Okay. I'm happy to talk about it. I love okay. talking about it. <laughs> yeah, Buddha's view is radically different from ours, okay? But maybe as interesting as a thought. Not to, he's not asking us to believe him. He's not a creator. He's just saying this is what he's found to be so, okay? So his view is very different from ours. And I would say certainly for myself, who is a f kind of jumped in the deep end Buddhist, you know, I like the big picture. That's my trip, okay? So that means this view for me is very powerful in its effect on helping me own what's in my mind. So... If I have the view, that, say the, the, the philosophical materialist view, which is the view we mostly just have as the truth, that mummy and daddy made me, right? Which is the view we tend to have, isn't it? Mummy and daddy made me. Which means there was no Rabina the second before conception. So Rabina, let's say she began at conception, that she pops into this world and then she starts to have problems and maybe daddy harms her and mummy does this and the, the mean Catholic nuns did that and the next door neighbour did this. Do you get my point? We meet things in our lives and people are mean to us. So we say, well, no idea why, just pot luck, it's just good luck, bad luck, whatever. You know, we don't know why and we certainly don't know why we have these tendencies. Mummy, you know, mummy might not be very angry but we get very angry. Mummy might, might, might be good at music but you're good at music. So we can see they don't necessarily necessarily come from mummy and daddy and this is the Buddha's point if they Buddha Buddha is we Buddha's view is we come into this life our consciousness is not physical it's a continuity of mental moments and if you get to the first second of conception if you had perfect memory you can go back from now back to the first second of conception each second you go well where did that moment of mine come from well the previous moment and where did that one come from well the previous moment and you keep getting back to the moment of conception and then of course the question is where did the previous moment come from that has to be a previous moment it can't be something that has no cause. That's a weird idea. So for the Buddha, 
your mother's egg and sperm popped in together. They worked very hard to get them together. But they are not the cause of your, of your mind. Not one skerrick of your mind comes from your mummy and daddy. That's a big shock to us. We've got to think that through. Buddha's view. Your consciousness, nor does your consciousness come from a superior being. Buddha does not have the view of a creator at all. He says, our body, <coughs> our egg and sperm come from mummy and daddy, but your anger and your love and your kindness and your tendencies and your trauma and your this and your that, they come from previous moments of those tendencies in that river of mental moments. And a, through, a few weeks before that, it was in a previous body. And this is not some hippie trippy thing made up by the hippies in the 60s. This is from hundreds of years before the Buddha. This is an Asian world view coming from the, <coughs> the views of these amazing Indians, you know. So, you know, Buddha came along and then he diverged in his own direction. Because he's not a creator, he is telling us, and just hear these words very simply, please. He doesn't ask you to believe him. But he was a regular guy who came to these observations in the depth of his own mind about reality, about this. He says, yes, it's, 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 it's a truth, it's a fact that consciousness is a beginningless continuity of mental moments. It goes back and back and back. And whatever's in it is what we put in it before. And what we do now in this life, we're programming this consciousness that will carry on when we die. So the general idea here, and this is a business of karma, that basically we've got a bunch of habits that are our habits. This love, this compassion we've got, this tendency to be kind or generous or play music or football or be neurotic or disturbed, these are all our tendencies. They don't come from the external event. They don't come from mummy and daddy. They are not a function of our genes or DNA or our brain. This is a shock initially because our model would say they are. So it needs thinking about. The Buddha would say these are tendencies in my own consciousness that I brought with me from the past. So with that, without going to any detail about that, and we certainly will be tomorrow morning in our workshop tomorrow, the implication of this I found so powerful in my life is that truly what's in my mind is mine. It is actually mine from my own past, but that includes all the good. So when we can focus on the good and own the good, it is easy to own the neurosis. It is not complicated and not difficult. We can be courageous and fearless. And because we also know my mind is not set in stone, there's nothing I can't unpack and unravel and nothing I can't change. So there's a lot of confidence, kind of a sense of stopping what's come from this from my mind is stopping blaming the external events. And the thing is, what's interesting, we blame, why are you happy, Rabina? Oh, Fred is so kind to me. Well, I'm blaming Fred for my happiness, aren't I? Why are you miserable, Rabina? Well, Fred cheats on me. We blame him for my suffering. The Buddha says, yes, Fred was kind to you one day. Fred was mean to the next. They are true. They do play a role. But he's saying they're merely a catalyst. That the main cause of my suffering is my own tendency to be angry. And the main cause of my happiness is my own tendency to be happy. That they're mine. So there's this fierce attitude in Buddhism. Well, fierce because it's not how we think. That everything in my mind is mine. And then, of course, the karmic one goes into more detail about even why you meet certain people and why they do things to us, including all the good. It's a very different view of the universe, you know. Shocking, yeah. It is shocking. Because it sounds to us like blame. It sounds to us like blame, but the, it's, it, it, the Buddha's view is it's accountability. That every living being, Buddha says, is necessarily experiencing the fruits of our own past. That as the Dalai Lama put it, we're like our own creators. So when we can hear that in an optimistic way, then it's, it brings enormous sense of um, ownership and a sense of accountability and a sense of not victim. I can see this in my own life, radically. It, 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 you stop feeling like it's not. We have it, you see, we have in our life things are good luck and things are bad luck. Do we not? No one knows why. Just good luck happens, bad luck happens. I think having that view, when we think we're so scientific, is kind of shocking. The Buddha says there's no, there's no thing that doesn't have a cause and there's no thing we can't unpack to find the cause. Buddha says everything is knowable. He's not like the Christian teaching where God is a superior being who makes everything. Buddha says we created ourselves by our own actions and that's every sentient being. There's more detail to it, but I don't know whether we go into it or not. I'm not sure. <laughs>